Right. Good evening, everybody. Um, we are very delighted to have Ian Spencer with us once again, giving us his uh, knowledge and wisdom on the question of why Marx. And tonight he's going to be looking at why the UK has never produced a Max revolutionary Marxist party. He's also going to be looking at Marx and Engels and the British unions and the predecessors of the Labour Party, the ILP, the LRC, SDF and Socialist League. So I'll say no more, but hand over to Ian. Good evening, comrades. Um, uh, those of you who have been absolutely enthralled at the Labour Party conference uh, will enjoy the vision of lots of union flags and not much evidence of what we might call socialism. And of course, what we often find is about this time, um, lots of people on the left uh, scream and shout about the betrayal of the Labour Party uh, of any kind of idea around a, a, a socialist idea or even um, a close relationship with the trade unions. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that the Labour Party doesn't engage in a betrayal of socialism, but that it has never been socialist from its inception. Um, in looking at the history of uh, the Labour Party uh, and its relationship to not only its own founders, but to Marx, Engels, um, Eleanor Marx, who played a, an important role. Um, what we'll see is that, in fact, if anything, um, the British Labour movement has historically <laughs> started off as the tail end, really, of the Liberal Party and of, uh, of what one might call liberal radicalism. And... Um, the trajectory followed by the Labour Party, whether it's towards nationalisation rather than the common ownership of the means of production, um, is an intrinsic part of the early founders of the Labour Party. Um, so the picture you see here is the famous picture taken of the Chartists uh, meeting on Kennington Common um, in 1848. Uh, Frederick Engels, of course, uh, was in London about this time and, as it were, caught the tail end of the uh, of what had been a, a, an awake, a reawakening of the Chartist movement in 1848. Uh, and it's interesting as well that if you go through the selected work, the collected works of Marx and Engels and look for references to the British trade union movement, it's quite often Engel, it's quite often Engels that writes upon it, um, which is understandable. They had a kind of um, uh, division of labour between them where Marx was concentrating on economic studies and philosophy and so on. Um, Engels, of course, as a f factory manager in Manchester, had a great deal of contact with the British uh, workers' movement from the other side of the fence and also uh, as, as a as a, a well-informed commentator and, and revolutionary. Um, so um, in the condition of the working classes in England, uh, Engels um, uh, appears to be is, is pretty critical of, of of the trade union movement in Britain. Um, the trade union movement in Britain, having evolved as it were uh, early on, uh, it, it uh, uh, arguably some of the craft unions were related to had a historical background in 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 guilds, um, and uh, what. He, Marx and Engels saw during the course of their lifetime was the development of a new unionism, a uh, general workers' unionism, uh, which by the 1880s uh, was producing significant differences in the old unions, as it were, that were rooted in the protection of, uh, of, uh, of craft union members' particular interests uh, against uh, competition. And so in 1845, in the condition of the working class in England, Engels says, uh, but what gives these unions and their strikes arising from them their real importance is this. They are the first attempt of the workers to abolish competition, that is to say competition among the working class uh, for scarce jobs and later uh, other services too. Um, in the context of Britain in the 1840s, um, he doesn't have a high regard for those he regards as socialists or regard themselves as socialists. Socialists, he says, are thoroughly tame and peaceable, except our existing order, bad as, it, bad as it is, so far as to reject all other methods, but that of winning public opinion. And this then 
is the beginning of a theme which I would argue comes down to the present. The idea that somehow um, trade disputes are won by maintaining popular public support rather than by uh, changing anything to do with uh, the way in which um, the surplus is extracted from the working population. Um, by 1888, 1889, and the great dock strike, I mean, there's a good example there in the context of the dock workers in 1889, before the strike, um, workers simply had to stand outside the docks in the hope of picking up some uh, from casual labour uh, as each day went by. Uh, and they were often the poorest in one of the poorest parts of London in the East End and around the docks. Um, many men were so hungry, uh, they could only work for a short period of time uh, and take whatever pay they could uh, in, in order to feed themselves. So um, under the leadership of Tom Mann, Ben Tillett and so on, uh, and others who I'll come on to shortly, um, the dock strike was, was a great success uh, and started to show the, the possibility of what trade unions could do in terms of not only winning uh, gains for, for their members, but potentially posing uh, a, a, a challenge to the ruling class itself. Um, Marx has this to say in his essay, uh, well, lecture really on wages, price and profit. Um, wages, price and profit um, it was delivered as a, as a lecture to uh, the First International. Um, and uh, it's an important piece of work and it's a very useful starting point for those who want to, to read Capital. Um, so uh, at the end of one of the chapters, he says on the trade unions, um, Instead of the conservative motto, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, they ought to inscribe on their banner the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the wages system. Um, just out of idle curiosity, uh, I'd started to flick through some of the trade union um, uh, websites uh, before, before presenting this. And uh, you know, look at the Royal College of Nursing website, look at a whole range of different unions websites. The talk is of fair pay. Um, Marx here is arguing for the abolition of the wages system, and most of the trade unions have, in fact, done never have never done anything more uh, than haggle over the price at which workers are exploited, rather than ever challenging the exploitation of the working class. And uh, this was one of the principal divisions uh, between uh, Marx and Engels uh, and some of the other members, for example, of the Social Democratic Federation, which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, and one of the other great divisions, of course, was participation in Parliament. Um, the Social Democratic Federation, originally founded as simply the Democratic Federation, it became the Social Democratic Federation in uh, 1887. Um, so founded in 1881, um, it had some interesting uh, members. Uh, these are not the only ones, but I've taken a, a, a brief selection. Just to give you an illustration of what the background was to one of the organizations which went on subsequently to make up part of, uh, of the early Labour Party. Henry Hindman, I'm going to talk about more in a moment, but it's fair to say at this stage uh, that Marx detested Henry Hindman uh, on a personal level as well as a political one. He regarded him as little more than a kind of political chancer, as it were, whose, whose sole interest uh, was in gaining a place in Parliament for himself predominantly, um, and was entirely con concerned with electoral politics uh, to the exclusion of working with trade unions. Heinemann uh, also annoyed Marx personally uh, as he plagiarised his work. Um, Heinemann, as we'll see, uh, produced a number of books uh, which lifted tracts, often distorted them uh, and passed them off as his own work uh, without any kind of reference to Marx whatsoever. Um, James Conley, I'm not going to talk a lot about because I want to come back to him more uh, when we talk about syndicalism in a, in a few weeks' time. However, uh, most of you will, of course, know of James Conley as um, the leader of the Easter Uprising in uh, Dublin in uh, 1916. But Connolly was briefly a member of the Social Democratic Federation and lots of other organisations as well. The reason why I'm going to talk about him in the context of syndicalism is that for a while he was in the United States and was a member of the uh, International Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies. Um, and he was an associate of Daniel De Leon, 
Uh, and in, his, in that context, I think it's worth talking about Connolly uh, under syndicalism, although, of course, Connolly uh, is a fairly complex figure and deserves a session on, on his own, which he has had uh, in this group at different times uh, when we were doing, for example, the lives of the left. Um, coming then on to uh, Eleanor Marx, uh, I'll mention her a bit here and then a bit more later. Eleanor Marx uh, is typically known as really as, as Karl Marx's youngest daughter, but that overlooks her quite enormous contribution in her own right. Um, she uh, had a hand in translating Capital, uh, Volume One, uh, along with her husband. They were never formally married, but her husband, uh, Edward Aveling. Um, and uh, she made a number of other very important contributions, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Um, and William Morris. Uh, William Morris today, of course, is largely thought of as um, a, a, a printmaker, the uh, originator of lots of nice patterns of wallpaper and dress material for s beloved of middle class people everywhere. Um, and a, a kind of leading figure in the arts and crafts movement. It's interesting that somebody who was politically radical, as it were, uh, albeit in a, in a rather strange way, um, was so conservative aesthetically. Um, most of his aesthetic work, most of his artistic works were concerned with uh, trying to reclaim uh, as a, almost a golden age of, of the past. So a period uh, uh, looking back to um, the medieval period, looking back to the Elizabethan period, uh, and, and trying to recreate uh, old craft forms in opposition to the mass production uh, that, uh, that, that, that poor people had to put up with. Um, William Morris himself uh, was, as it were, on the left of the Social Democratic Federation, but it, that, in a sense, doesn't say a great deal in that later on he um, tended to affiliate more with the anarchist side of the uh, of, of of the of the of the socialist league which split away from the social democratic federation um george lansbury was an interesting character because he um was one of the few in a sense that we might would have regarded himself perhaps uh, as, a, as, a, as 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 firmly on the left he had a um, he, he was a, a brief for a brief period led the Labour Party after uh, the period in which um, the Labour Party formed uh, the national government in coalition with the Conservative Party in 1931, um, and he led the the, the rump group of the uh, Parliamentary Labour Party, uh, while Herbert Morrison led the party as a whole. Uh, it was interesting in other ways. He supported the Russian Revolution. He opposed uh, participation in the First World War. Uh, he was actively in favour of women's suffrage. Um, and he represented uh, a, a, a part of the left of the Labour Party, uh, which, which is largely overlooked today. Um, Tom Mann, uh, some of you will know, uh, was a leader along with Ben Tillett of the, the dock strike of 1889. And um, of all the people that um, Engels refers to, Tom Mann is, is, comes out as, as one that's uh, uh, held in, in higher regard, although Engels expresses his frustration that Tom Mann could get excited about the fact that he was going to be having dinner with the Lord Mayor uh, on a particular day. So, um, you see this frustration in, in Engels and Marx uh, of the, the tendency on, which, on, the, on the part of um, uh, the, the British Labour movement to be somewhat fawning uh, towards members of authority. Uh, and uh, the, the Social Democratic Federation as a whole were not particularly supported by Marx and Engels, largely because of the de detestation of Henry Heinemann, to which I'll now turn. Um, Heinemann himself um occupies quite a lot of uh ire on the part of um Marx and Engels he was, himself was a conservative son of, of a wealthy businessman he graduated from Trinity College Cambridge he was a he was a uh, very much a conservative figure um, one might suggest that might say that there was a, a 
an element of the kind of radical liberalism about him. Uh, but initially he, he became a socialist after reading a, a novel by uh, Ferdinand Lasalle, and then subsequently the Manifesto of the Communist Party. Um, England for All was a book he wrote in, in 1881, which uh, widely plagiarized uh, both the Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital, uh, and wrote a number of other books, which the interesting thing about them was that they were very popular, um, which annoyed Marx even more, I suspect. Um, that Along with people like uh, Jules Guide, I mentioned last week in the context of the French party, Heinemann had a capacity for popularizing uh, stuff to a wide audience. But if you look at it carefully, um, it's often a, a bolderized version of Marx. It's a bolderized version uh, of socialist ideas. And he was also a kind of uh, admirer, for example, of Giuseppe Mazzini, who was a, an Italian nationalist, um, who, unlike Giuseppe Garibaldi, uh, was 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 fairly right wing, really. And um, Mazzini famously opposed Marx in the context of uh, the First International. By contrast, uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi was a member of the First International International Working Men's Association. Um, Heinemann was also uh, thoroughly anti-Semitic. What exactly what um, one might call the socialism of fools, uh, where he um, expressly kind of um, it tended to refer to Jewish capital as if somehow that 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 made capital somehow worse the fact that it was Jewish capital um and uh and he was also a a, a, a pretty principal supporter of British imperialism he had no interest whatsoever in in um the effect that the British Empire was having on on peoples around the world um the left eventually split from the Social Democratic Federation to form the Socialist League. Among the many things that uh, Henry Heinemann an annoyed people by was that he actually took money from the Conservative Party <laughs> to the tune of about 340 quid uh, in order to found Social Democratic Federation candidates. Um, and of course, the Conservatives' uh, interest in this was absolutely crystal clear. They wanted... Um, Social Democratic Federation candidates to stand against liberals in areas where the where there was would otherwise be a straight fight between Tories and liberals, uh, and therefore allowing the Tories to win. And Heinemann took the money and fell for it, despite the fact that none of his candidates that he put up actually got more than well one candidate um, got a, a a few hundred votes and the others got votes in their tens uh, and. Um, it was one of the, the many aspects which Marx saw in Heinemann an unprincipled opportunist, somebody who was only really interested in politics from the point of view of it being a, a, a career for him. He, um, uh, his, his legacy, if he has one at all, is that uh, the, the Socialist Party of Great Britain, which was founded in uh, 1911, out of the kind of shattered remnants of the Social De Democratic Federation, absolutely, even to this day, uh, refuses to have a leader as such because of the pernicious effect of Henry Heinemann. Uh, he was regarded as being a kind of thoroughly dictatorial leader uh, and wanted to run it as a kind of personal fiefdom, as it were. And, and so in 1884, the left split to form the Socialist League. Uh, and here you see uh, the arts and crafts um, influence on, on the Socialist League. Um, uh, so uh, some curious characters here that probably people, I mean, I had never heard of Ernest Belfort Bax until I went to university. And the only reason why I heard of Be Ernest Belfort Bax then uh, was because um, one of my lecturers had done quite a lot of research and published a very expensive book on Ernest Belfort Bax. Ernest Belfort Bax was an interesting character in so far as he had uh, gone to Germany in 1879 to study music, uh, having come from a, a fairly well-off background, um, and obviously becoming fluent in German, became very interested in German philosophy. Uh, he didn't really succeed as a musician, uh, but became one of the few uh, intellectuals in the British left uh, to have any kind of um, schooling in, in 
Hegel, Kant, and various others. But the interesting thing about it was that he wanted to have a kind of Hegelian socialism. He didn't want the, the materialism that, that Marx uh, put forward. So once again, we see this recurring fi figure, uh, this recurring feature uh, in um, socialist parties where a, a, a bolderized, stunted version of Marx was being presented in a populist way uh, and often in a way which was, um, to say the least, uh, not really fully in accord with what Marx was arguing, as we'll go on to see, uh, typically uh, arguing in favour of cooperatives rather than the idea of the common ownership of the means of production, often arguing in favour of nationalisation rather than the common ownership of the means of production, as if they were the same, somehow the same thing. Um, returning then to William Morris, I mean, one of the things that was important about Morris was effectively he was bankrolling uh, the Socialist League, uh, the newspaper of the Socialist League, the Commonweal, which pr published a number of very influential articles. Uh, um, Eleanor Marx, for example, um, had a, a, a regular column in uh, uh, the Commonweal about the international socialist movement, uh, which, of course, she was well versed in uh, through, through her family. Um, immersed in, indeed. Um, William Morris did a lot to popularise socialist ideas, uh, albeit not Marxist ideas. Uh, so um, Morris himself uh, was part of the Socialist League that was adamantly opposed to the idea of uh, engaging in um, politi political activity, um, involvement in, in, in politics and elections. Um, and by contrast, Eleanor Marx, Edward Aveling, Tom Mann were all vehemently in favour of some kind of political representation for the working class uh, and, and of using parliamentary forms uh, to, to promulgate socialism. Um, coming back to Eleanor Marx, for example, um, her, she was always known, all the Marx daughters, um, Jenny was known as Jenny Shen because uh, she was little Jenny, as it were. Actually, all the girls were called Jenny and some other name. Um, uh, uh, Laura was known as Shushu, and Eleanor was known as Tussie. Um, and the idea that she was just Mrs. Edward Aveling uh, is also uh, somewhat obscene. Her own contributions were enormous. Uh, not only did she have a hand in uh, translating capital alongside Edward Aveling, but she also had a hand in uh, translating um, socialism, utopian and scientific um, and, and making that widely available. She also was quite an extraordinary uh, linguist uh, in her own right. She, unlike her father, embraced her Jewish heritage in no small part because of, out of solidarity with the Jewish, Jewish, prolet Jewish proletarians that she encountered in the East End of London. Um, for example, Eleanor Marx had a hand in um, the, the, the Bryant and May uh, Match Girls strike. Uh, she had a hand in a demonstration in 1887, which became known as Bloody Sunday, which was um, concerned with the oppression in Ireland and also uh, poverty in the UK as a whole. Um, uh, which was violently suppressed by the police um, in 1887. Um, she uh, had a hand in 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 supporting the the great dock strike of 1889. She also just uh, as part of her uh, interest in in the, the fate of Jewish workers in East London, many of whom were working in sweaty trades in, in the rag trade and so on. Um, she learned Yiddish. Uh, to the extent that she could actually give lectures in Yiddish. Um, she taught herself Norwegian, as you do, uh, because she also had a, an avid interest in um, drama. Uh, now, uh, I've heard one person say years and years ago uh, was that all she really wanted to be was an actress. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, yes, I think she would have liked to have been an actress, uh, but um, her even her interest in dramatic art had a, had a profound political content. Um, it is said that um, when Marx was writing Capital, uh, uh, Tussie would 
be playing in the room as he said about his work. And Marx would often make up stories to explain what capital was about to her. <laughs> and even at an early age, even when, um, uh, even what we would regard as primary school age, uh, Tussie would be able to recite Shakespeare uh, and and did. Um, so she was immersed in in uh, dramatic art from an early age. And it's often forgotten that Marx and Engels were both interested in poetry and loved Shakespeare and and and, and dramatic art and so on. She so she uh, taught herself Norwegian so she could. Uh, translate and perform the work of Henrik Ibsen uh, in English. And she was the first person to translate The Enemy of the People uh, into, into English. Uh, she also uh, was in a, a, a reading, which didn't get a huge audience, of, of one of Henrik Ibsen's work, The Doll's House, um, and was in that alongside George Bernard Shaw and Edward Aveling. So for Helena Marx, who has her own formidable contribution to socialist action and, and ideas, it was as a translator and as someone who could draw the, the, the connection between art and literature and politics. Um, Edward Aveling, uh, another interesting character, uh, again, in a sense, best known for his translation of Capital, Volume 1, along with Samuel Moore. Um, I'm told uh, that uh, the more Aveling version is still the best translation, uh, though many of you will have the Pelican edition, which is fine. Um, but uh, more Aveling, uh, assisted by uh, Eleanor Marx, um, translated volume one capital. Um, Aveling himself uh, was a curious polymath character. He trained as a doctor, but didn't finish the training uh, completely and switched instead to kind of physiology and zoology and gave lectures in um, science and was a popularizer of science and popularizer of the work of Charles Darwin. Aveling um, actually met Karl Marx only once uh, when he was giving a lecture on flowers and insects uh, to which um, Marx and Eleanor uh, Marx uh, had attended, uh, and he spoke very highly of, of, of Karl Marx, and, and it was from there that a, a relationship started with the dog. What a cracking night out that must have been, uh, Flowers and Insects uh, by Edward Aveling. Um, Aveling, of course, is also known as the person who was really quite unpleasant. Uh, it, Eleanor Marx committed, you'll see that the, the, the year of their death is the same, uh, Eleanor Marx committed suicide when he discovered when she discovered that Edward Aveling had gone and married someone else, uh, despite the fact that he'd been in a relationship with Eleanor Marx for many years. Eleanor Marx uh, took her own life in in 1898 uh, with uh, at a time when you could buy a cyanide over the counter at the chemist's. Um, a, a, a tragic loss to the workers' movement, if ever there was one. Um, Thomas Mann, I've already mentioned in terms of his uh, leading role in the context of the great dock strike along with Ben Tillett and others. However, by 1888, the Socialist League um, ha had really become dominated by anarchists and um, William Morris himself had no interest whatsoever in, in pursuing a kind of political angle on the part of uh, the Socialist League uh, and preferred instead uh, uh, the, the kind of anarchist route. Um, it's not clear to me that Morris had really read very much of Marx at all and was more influenced actually by the work of, uh, once again, Prince Peter Kropotkin, uh, who we uh, encountered when we looked at Marx and the anarchists. Um, William Morris was a, was a close associate of Peter Kropotkin when he was in London. Um, so Effectively, from the Socialist League, then it, the, the Marxists, such as there were, and as you see, there really weren't very many, um, um, resigned. And uh, what we then move on to is what is the kind of origins of the Labour Party as a whole. Um, Frederick Engels interviewed in 1893, when asked about um, the Fabian Society, uh, said of the Fabians, the Fabian Society I take to be uh, nothing more than a branch of the Liberal Party. Um, 
And of course, this is a reflection of the fact that many of the people who were part of the Independent Labour Party, the Labour Representation Committee, and indeed the Fabian Society, were at one or time, one time or other liberals. The history of the British trade union movement was a, is, was a one of, as it were, tail ending the Liberal Party, um, where, for example, there was a possibility, uh, oh, the, the only, the, the, the first Labour MPs were elected uh, often as Liberals or as Labour Liberals or Liberal Labour people um, in seats that, where there was no liberal candidate. Um, and quite often the Liberal Party assigned um, uh, potential seats of, for, for working people um, in, in areas where they had no hope of winning. And the Conservatives were fully aware of the possibility of Labour and the Liberals uh, of splitting the vote and allowing the Conservative in. Uh, this is again a theme that we see today. And um, when Keir, Keir Starmer, <laughs> No relation to Keir Hardy uh, it was sprinkled with glitter. It was it was sprinkled with glitter. Uh, it was uh, by somebody protesting about the election system, the idea. And so um, today, I I can foresee uh, very easily uh, that the question will be: Do you vote Labour or do you vote Tusk or some other uh, group of people uh, who uh, will be standing on an explicitly Marxist position? Um, I'm not going to say too much about. All the others, uh, except I'll come on a bit more to Ramsay MacDonald in a moment. But Sydney and Beatrice Webb were in interesting. You know, uh, what uh, Sydney Webb was briefly, I, I, was, I was astonished to read this, um, briefly the, the Member of Parliament for Seaham, uh, which is very near where I live and where my mum grew up. Uh, but Sydney Webb was uh, briefly a Member of Parliament for Seaham. Uh, and um, was later made Baron Passfield. Uh, so Sydney and Beatrice Webb were Baron and Baroness Passfield. Uh, among their other contributions to society was that they established the London School of Economics, but they were resolutely liberals. Um, they also had uh, some fairly other uh, unsavoury aspects to them. Um, they were both convinced eugenicists, as was George Bernard Shaw, uh, but eugenicists, um, were kind of widespread at the time. And Francis Galton, uh, who was the kind of leading proponent of, eug of eugenics in Britain at the time, was hugely influential and widely courted. And of course, it was Francis Galton who f coined the phrase um, <clears throat> survival of the fittest. Uh, it wasn't uh, Darwin. So H.G. Wells, George Bernard Shaw, Ramsay MacDonald, Emily Pantacles, they were, these were all members of the Fabian Society. They weren't the founders of it, uh, but the, most of the founders of it uh, are languish in obscurity. Um, and the Fabian Society uh, was one of the socialist societies that, uh, and still to this day is a socialist society which is affiliated to the Labour Party. And you can be, for example, uh, the Fabian Society delegate to your local constituency Labour Party. Indeed, uh, Margaret Hodge, <laughs> when I was in Islington South and Finsbury Labour Party, Margaret Hodge was the Fabian Society um, <laughs> uh, delegate to Islington South and Finsbury Constituency Labour Party. And I think that probably tells you as much as you need to know about the Fabian Society in the present. The, the, um, the coat of arms that you see there is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, this was, believe it or not, <laughs> an early attempt on the part of the Fabian Society to design for itself a coat of arms. Uh, initially, uh, well, now, uh, I think they use the tortoise, the, the analogy being the tortoise and the hare. Uh, slow, and, uh, uh, slow and steady wins the race, as it were. Um, but here it's the wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, perhaps it might be best uh, as a sheep in sheep's clothing. Um, but the Fabian Society has always constituted that part of, 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 of right-wing labour uh, that was, as Engels observed, really little more than a, a branch of the Liberal Party uh, of, its of its day. Uh, Fabian Society, uh, by the way, uh, from the Roman general Fabius, uh, who in, in the Punic Wars uh, used the kind of guerrilla tactics to wear down Hannibal uh, rather than a, a full uh, frontal confrontation in the battlefield. Um, this is uh, James Keir Hardy. Uh, Keir Hardy was a liberal uh, and really remained a radical liberal, but arguably moved to the left somewhat. 
um, never really a Marxist. Uh, and here is uh, Frederick Engels' uh, appraisal of him. Uh, he's mentioned in a few places, uh, but um, he was a, in, 19, in 1879, he was a, a, a leader of the, of the Miners' Union. And Engels says of the Independent Labour Party at the time, uh, the Independent Labour Party is extremely indefinite in its tactics, and its leader, Keir Hardy, is a super cunning Scot whose demagogic tricks are not to be trusted for a moment. Um, Engels here is really arguing that, uh, as a somebody who had tail-ended the Liberal Party, uh, had really little interest in um, the revolutionary transformation of society, but was instead um, committed to um, parliamentary action alone in, the, in just the same way that Hindman was, uh, albeit a little bit less duplicitous. Uh, and, um, but anyway, in 1892, he became the Liberal MP for West Ham, which at the time was, a, was, was, was part of Essex and is now, of course, um, a, a part of the, the London conurbation. Uh, and then, by 1900, he was the Labour MP for Merthyr Tidfil, which he was for, for the last 15 years of his life. Um, I know that uh, Ramsay MacDonald uh, was also in uh, the Independent Labour Party, but I, I've included him here as part of the, the Labour Representation Committee. Um, in combing through, in preparing for this and combing through the um, Marx and Engels selected corris uh, collected correspondence. Um, <laughs> uh, I only found one represent one uh, reference to Ramsay Macdonald, and it was as the miserable Macdonald um, in the context of uh, his support for uh, uh, the Liberal Party in the context of the uh, of a of a state visit of the Tsar of Russia uh, to Britain. But James Ramsay Macdonald. Um, was a member of the National Liberal Club and the Fabian Society, uh, making that point again. Um, his one of his great contributions, I suppose, if you if you if you if you think uh, the coming to prominence of the Labour Party was it was, a, was a great project. Uh, in 1903, it, he was responsible for the um, pact between himself and Gladstone. This is not William Ewart Gladstone, but his son. Um, where they effectively had a, a, a secret uh, pact uh, to not stand um, uh, liberal candidates against Labour candidates and vice versa. Uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, in 1906, um, 29 Labour MPs were elected. And then later on, um, uh, the Liberals were able to form a, uh, a government effectively with Labour help. Uh, in the 1910 um, uh, Liberal government, for example, um, was almost completely dependent upon a cohort of around uh, 40 uh, Labour MPs. Um, as part of the background of this, the Communist Party of Great Britain was founded in 1920. Uh, and of course, James Ramsey, Ramsey MacDonald was completely opposed to it. And moreover, uh, uh, despite his opposition to World War One, his opposition to World War One, along with James Keir Hardy, by the way, uh, was not on the basis of 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 socialism. And this was a fratricidal war of workers against workers in the interests of imperialism. The kind of position that would have been taken, for example, by Will Willie Gallagher in Scotland, um, but instead uh, it, it was on the basis of, of a combination of pacifism and regarding. Uh, the likelihood of the First World War of being a, an economic disaster for Britain, which indeed it was. After the First World War, Britain was transformed from being a creditor nation into a debtor nation. Um, so opposed World War I, as did uh, James Keir Hardy, as did others, by the way, um, uh, even Manny Shinwell uh, opposed um, the British involvement in World War One, and Manny Shinwell, interestingly, uh, took uh, James Ramsey Macdonald's seat off him, which also happened to be in Seaham. Uh, Seaham Harbour seems to have been a, a go-to place for a nice safe seat for uh, wannabe uh, uh, Labour careerists. So Ramsey Macdonald was Prime Minister from January to November 1924, and again in 1929 to 1935. In 1931, 
uh, he formed uh, a, a national government with the Conservatives. So the whole history of the Labour Party hasn't been a history of betrayal. It's been a history of being effectively an adjunct to the Liberal Party, which has subsequently um, resumed power in the interests of, the, of, 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 of itself. And the whole question about the relationship, for example, between um, the Parliamentary Labour Party and, uh, the and, and the actual membership of the Labour Party was as much a, 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 an issue for James Ramsey and MacDonald uh, as, it, as it is today uh, for those who, who, who think that a, a terrible opportunity has been missed with the defeat of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and as an aside, uh, I remember talking to my mum about all of this years ago, and as a child, she remembers uh, the miners in Seaham trying to turn over James Ramsey MacDonald's car, and rightly so. And in conclusion, then, I'll leave you with this nice little quote that I found uh, from Friedrich Engels to Georgi Plekhanov, in, and of course we'll be talking about the Russian Marxists in a few weeks, in 1894, um, one is indeed driven to despair by these English workers with a sense of imaginary super national superiority, with their essentially bourgeois ideas and viewpoints, with their practical narrow-mindedness, with the parliamentary corruption which has seriously infected the leaders. The only thing is that the practical English will be the last to arrive, but when they do arrive, their contribution will weigh quite heavy in the scale. Whether he's being over ambitious in that last paragraph or whether we are indeed living in interesting times remains to be seen. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, lots of lovely personal details. Yes, I'm trying. There we are, back again on video. Um, that I, that was really really interesting, um, fascinating stuff uh, about all the, the characters that were involved, but also the evolution of the Labour Party. Um, I obviously will open now to comments and questions and contributions from the floor. So, if anybody would like to uh, ask a question or make a contribution, uh, please would they put their raise their hand? And I can see Tina is wanting is raising her hand already. <laughs> okay, Tina. I will um, add Sarah. <laughs> Hello. My internet is a bit unstable. I hope it, it's good enough for this. Thank you very much, Ian. Very interesting um, opening. Firstly, uh, Mark's daughter's called Tossie, <laughs> not Tassie. <laughs> it's, it's pronounced Tussie, um, which has actually become a bit of a swear word. Um, but anyway, not, not a proper swear word. It's more like a your stupid toasty type of thing. So it's not something you'd call your child today. Um, you mentioned right at the beginning, and of course I agree, sort of the, the Labour Party, you know, was never socialist and people who claim, you know, oh, we need to reclaim it for socialism, et cetera, misunderstand the nature of it and quite right too. I think it was a very um, mixed bag. Um, as Lenin pointed out as well, and I just wondered if you agree with his, um, definition of, you know, that famous definition of a, of a bourgeois workers' party where you got the, the trade union and, you know, some of the socialist uh, organizations um, signed up on the left, you know, the, the, the workers' wing, as well as the bourgeois wing, uh, the, the representatives of the, of the bourgeoisie, if you think that is still um, correct, because um, it's still, we still have the affiliated unions and that's still going on. And I would argue that still makes it a bourgeois workers' party. Yes, it has changed massively um, in the last few years. Um, first, it changed dramatically, obviously, with, with Corbyn being elected when the working class um, poll was very strong again. And then now it's being moved back to the, the bourgeois poll, a bit like it was perhaps under Tony Blair. So those who claim that, you know, Starmer is evil personified and... <laughs> I have to say, I've, I've, I found that I find this a uh, Stop Starmer uh, campaign very difficult. That they've written in their blurb, he's the most untrustworthy Labour politician, not, not the most untrustworthy politician ever. <laughs> like, he's worse than Boris Johnson, he's worse than Tony Blair, who killed millions of people, you know, based on a lie. He, he gave the 
gave the go-ahead to go to war on Iraq based on a lie, and he knew it, and he's less bad than Starmer. Well, I, I you know, I think that's a misunderstanding how the work the Labour Party has always worked. So it's being drawn back and forth. And of course, it is possible that it's been lost now to the working class if the unions start um, disaffiliating, that would certainly make a big difference to it. And I'm not saying, you know, join the Labour Party, I'm not saying stay and fight, etc. The, the window of, of fighting has closed quite, quite some time ago, and most of us who spoke up have been expelled a long time ago. But, you know, it was always between left and right. It's not a qualitative difference at all what's been happening recently. It's going almost back to, you know, where it was many, many times before. And it maybe might be pulled back again. Who knows? But it's it's nothing special what's happening at the moment. Um, I was going to mention, though, I was going to ask you a question also about Clause 4, or not a question so much as the, but but bring it up because that's almost what I know the Fabians are most famous for, for having written the, you know, the, the, the clauses of membership in 1918, what we are, what, what, the, what, the, what the Labour Party is, and the most famous one is obviously Clause 4. And we've had a campaign recently by Socialist Appeal before they were chucked out, which was all about reclaiming that, that clause because it was so good and was so socialist, etc. And then you look at it and you think, really? I mean, the, the Fabians, obviously, they wrote it. And as you quite rightly point out, they were pro-imperialist. They were eugenicists and not, not the good kind who say that, you know, if you want to die, you should have the right to die. No, no, they wanted disabled people to be killed because they're burden on society. They were anti-working class. They didn't believe that the working class could make revolution, appealing to the bourgeoisie and middle class to understand how lovely socialism is and how good it is for them, being very patient and you know not not actually having a, a, a revolutionary outlook at all on not even what you know no, no the working class didn't play a central role for them at all. Um, Frederick Engels was quite disdainful about them, called them, I think, middle class folk or something. Um, they were pro-World War I, as I understand it, for a while. And coming out of that, obviously, the Russian Revolution out of the World War I, and that led a lot of left-wingers into the, the Labour Party. The Labour Party became, you know, was pulled to the left once again, as it, as it does in its history. It was the Marxist influence, the influence of the Russian Revolution, which many supported, at that time was was very strong and as i understand it this the the close four in particular was written as an anti-marxist um formulation and if you look at the we had we had we talked about the, the critique of the gotha program um a few times in between uh, in the last few weeks and marx made a big point about this this is lazalian idea as ian mentions you know we have to be a fair distribution on and you know it'll be in the hands of the people fairly distributed you know who decides what's fair you know who is that what is fairness what's justice these are all very bourgeois concepts it didn't talk about the means of production in workers hands it didn't talk about democracy it didn't talk about expanding production it didn't talk about people who can't work etc so it was all Marx riled against the Lazalian formulation in the Gotha program, which is almost identical to the one in Clause 4. So the Fabians took from the Gotha program on purpose, yeah, they took uh, from the critique of the Gotha, they, they took exactly that phrase that Marx was so critical of and put it in Clause, clause 4 as a, you know, yeah, two fingers up to Marx. The Labour Party has nothing to do with Marx. We're not Marxists, we're anti-Marxists. And then you have... Uh, you know, a hundred years, not even a hundred years later, you have the so-called Marxists fighting for the reinstatement of Clause 4, which was written against Marxists. So it's very, a very strange history um, that we keep forgetting those kind of things. And, you know, just because things sound nice, you know, or sound it sounds nice, doesn't it? Distributing fairly, etc. It doesn't mean anything, as, as Marx pointed out over and over again. You have to talk about who owns things, who controls things, you know, and, and who's, who's in charge and not somebody somewhere distributing stuff so um i think that's quite an interesting an interesting critique of the fabians which goes to the heart of their terrible terrible program 
Um, so I don't have a question as such on that on that issue, but the the bourgeois workers party, I'd be I'd be interested to hear view your view on that. Well, it'll come as no surprise. I agree with you. Uh, the, uh, you know, what uh, what was so vile, really, about the, the Fabians, for example, uh, was that in 1935, Sydney and Beatrice Webb published uh, Soviet Communism, a new civilization, question uh, mark. Now, 1935, they didn't, they were absolutely implacably opposed to the idea of Soviets, the idea of workers' councils taking power, the working class taking power for itself. Uh, but they were quite impressed with Comrade Stalin, as was George Bernard Shaw, who also quite liked Mussolini. Um, you know, what, once we get to the the point where uh, genuine communists are being murdered in in biblical proportions, uh, Sydney and Beatrice Webb were in favour of, of of Soviet civilization. Um, it, it, clause four is an interesting. I mean, you, you can I can probably recite most of it from the top of my head to secure for the workers. Um, but hang on a minute, <laughs> contrast that with Marx and uh, the, the, the liberation of the working class as the act of the workers themselves. Um, and the whole idea of, of Parliament being the means by which we have a slow, gradual, peaceful transition um, to, to, to socialism usually defined in terms of nationalization rather than um, the, the common ownership of the means of production, rather than workers actually uh, having their own industries in their own hands uh, and, 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 and managing society through direct participative democracy uh, was, was nowhere to be seen. Uh, let's also remember some of the other contributions that Sydney and Beatrice Webb made. And, it, and this is important for, for people who who get a bit dewy-eyed about the National Health Service as a, as a glowing example of, uh, of, of Fabian or Labour socialism. Uh, Sydney and Beatrice Webb were critics of the reform to the poor law in uh, um, uh, 1909. Um, people often forget that before the National Health Service, there was another National Health Service, and it was the poor law infirmaries. Uh, there were the poor law infirmaries and the asylums, and they were largely administered through the rates um, so local taxation was used to pay for the local hospital uh, or the local taxation was used to pay for the county asylum. And uh, this was part of the National Health Service that existed before the National Health Service. And this was, these were hospitals that are only used for the poor, really. The, the, the rich wouldn't go anywhere near them. Um, it, it, rich people were cared for by domestic servants at home. Uh, why would they go into nasty, dirty hospitals full of fleas and whatever? Um, and so... Uh, what you have in the National Health Service is, is exactly what you tend to see in all of those progenitors of, of, of the Labour Party, a call for nationalisation, the state control of things, rather than the common ownership of the means of production and the full democratic control. So clause for to secure for the workers by hand or brain and so on um, was about the nationalisation and rationalisation of the poor law, for example. So the, the National Health Service, when it came into being, was was just that it, it was the, the poor law institutions the asylums uh the the charitable hospitals which were already failing and because of the the, the demands placed upon them in, in the in the aftermath particularly of world war ii uh, they were already effectively de facto nationalized during world war one because uh, someone had to pay for all those wounded soldiers um and and william beveridge for example uh, sometimes credited with being the architect of uh, of the welfare state was of course a liberal, um, and so we see a, a continuity between the Liberal Party and 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 the Labour Party. The fact that the the Labour Party dissolve uh, the Liberal Party dissolve into a kind of rump um, uh, for for many years, and 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 plays a kind of uh, just a, a kind of protest vote vote role uh, is. It, it tells all you need to know. Effectively, the Labour Party is what the Liberal Party used to be. Um, um, so, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the eugenics was 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 pretty popular. I thought somebody made a reference to Mary Stopes as well. I mean, Mary Stopes was a, was another eugenicist who, I mean, she didn't she wanted women to be able to control their own fertility, which is right and proper, but she but mainly because she didn't want working class people reproducing. <laughs> she wasn't. Yeah. Only nice, nice people uh, and uh, people who didn't wear glasses. She, she fell out with her son because he, he came home with some, some woman who wore glasses. Uh, she was imperfect. Anyway, um, 
the, the whole history of the Labour Party is a history of opposition to socialism. And it's, a, it's now with regard to Lenin, of course, um, Lenin had no illusions about MacDonald and Henderson and all these other characters uh, and, and says so and, and, and famously says, because there was the whole campaign when the foundation of the Communist Party of Great Britain uh, was can it affiliate to the Labour Party and Lenin, of course, urged them to affiliate to the Labour Party and support the Labour Party as a rope supports a hanged man. The question is, is why has the whole British Labour, Labour movement been irredeemably bourgeois? Why, ha, why has there never been a revolution, a mass revolutionary uh, political party? And uh, my just suggestion is it's imperialism. And just as the whole of the Second International was implacably um, indifferent, <laughs> implac you can be implacably indifferent to uh, the idea of, 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 of freedom for um, colonies and, and, and doing anything about racism or anything else. Um, you don't see any of that in the Labour Party. And as we know, the Labour Party played a, a vile role uh, in terms of uh, British imperial policy. Um, just to take one small thing, you know, in 1945, the, 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 the Labour government, everybody gets very dewy eyed about. Um, uh, Clement Attlee had no qualms about Lord Louis Mountbatten, um, then Supreme Allied Commander of East Asia uh, and well known nonce. Um, uh, of rearming uh, the Japanese prisoners of war to make sure that the French got their colonies back. And therefore, the, the, the Labour Party had a hand in beginning the Vietnam War. And of course, Attlee also took us into the Korean War. So in terms of British imperialism and, and so on, uh, the, the history of the Labour Party isn't, isn't a glowing one. Uh, yes, it's a bourgeois workers' party. It's a... <laughs> Thank you very point. much indeed, Ian. That was <laughs> extremely, extremely detailed and again, fascinating reply. And thanks, Tina, for all those wonderful questions. Um, I'm going to go to Victor now. Victor, could you put your uh, put your video on so that I can spotlight you? Victor? Victor? Okay, we've got no Victor there. William, William O'Brien. I'll bring you in now to ask your question. Hi. Well, the British Labour Party, as far as we are concerned in Ireland, is a pro-imperialist party. It never actually uh, helped Ireland in any way whatsoever. As a matter of fact, every opportunity it got, it went against Ireland. It even supported the execution of, of the 1916 leaders. It uh, scurrilized Connolly. Uh, and then in more recent times, it actually done away with political status in Northern Ireland. Uh, it, that was uh, more than least done away with that. Then the worst uh, Secretary of State we ever had uh, in Northern Ireland was the so-called uh, left-wing Labour MP uh, called... Uh, oh. Uh, what's his name? The fellow who was, from, uh, was a minor. Uh, he, 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 Dennis Skinner? Who? You don't mean Dennis Skinner? No, no. Dennis Skinner was never Secretary of State. Oh. Uh, the other fellow, uh, you can see him now, and his name doesn't come to me. Uh, but anyway, he he's. Uh, you can see him walking uh, on his video. Uh, uh, on a YouTube video to the, the fields of Cross uh with the parachute regiment, given her boys a bit of a boost, uh, and then given out because the IRA was shooting them, uh, depleting the uh, the vote for the Labour Party. What does he expect? And uh, he, he was a left wing Labour MP. Uh, Mason, Roy Mason, right? He was he was ruthless. Now, if anything, the Tories, uh, Secretaries of State, when I half is uh, had on Ireland. Uh, as for the history of the Labour Party in Ireland, it's is is not very much. So James Connolly did found it, 
1912, after the uh, Irish uh, Congress of Trade Unions, or it was probably called the Congress of Irish Unions, uh, had a conference in uh, Tipperary, and that's when the, they, they formed a political party. Kennedy wasn't that keen on uh, parliamentary participation anyway. As you said yourself, he was a syndicalist, uh, and he got his politics mainly from America, with the industrial workers of the world. Uh, the other opposition to him was a fellow called William Walker. Now, William Walker was the vice chairman of the Independent Labour Party, totally opposed to uh, an Irishman, totally opposed to Irish independence, and was a white supremacist. Uh, he he felt that the British Empire was a progressive thing because it was bringing uh, savages into the modern world. That's savages being uh, indigenous people in Africa, and and that's that's what he thought. Now Connolly totally and absolutely opposed him. Uh, the Labour Party has been a party of imperialism. Uh, from a backward working class, as far as we're concerned, a backward working class in Britain. And I know because I was brought up in Britain, I was brought up in Birmingham. I went there when I was nine, and I left when I was 17. That's the first opportunity I got. I left it. And there was hardly a day gone back that I wasn't called some kind of an Irish bastard or some sort of it. There was, there was unreal that the, 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 I, I, I was ticked because I was Irish. Like, it was unreal. Now, I was thinking that if you want to really understand Ireland, or if you want to understand the British working class, you read Engels as opposed to Marx, because Engels lived with an Irish woman, and she was from the uh, travelling community, and he had the, he had a great insight into uh, the conditions of Ireland and the conditions of the English working class, which at the time were mainly immigrants from Ireland, especially in the linen industries and, and, and the textile industries in Lancashire, where he had his uh, factory. Uh, it was a woman called Bourne, but they, some people say she wasn't Irish because she didn't spell her name the way we spell it. We spell Bourne with a Y. But the thing is, she didn't spell her name at all because she was illiterate. That doesn't mean she was stupid. It's just that literacy wasn't universal at the time and she had no formal education. Now, when she died, he actually went to live, with, he, he, he cohabited then with her sister. And I seen a, a letter in the British Museum where uh, Marx nearly lost his sponsorship because he insulted uh, the woman. He, he said, now, Marx uh, was an alcoholic, of course, uh, and a drinking alcoholic. And he uh, sent a letter to, Mar to Engels saying, yeah, yeah, after uh, one of your daughter, your Irish bitches died, and then you're taking another one. And that was to that effect. And of course, Engel said, insult the women I love. You won't be getting any more money off me. So Max put pen to paper very quick and apologized. That sort of thing is not known, but it, it should be known. Now, uh, William, I know, do have quite a few other people who'd like to come in. Okay, I just want to say about what we're saying. Yeah. Uh, this was a case down. We have absolute faith for him. He is going to be the worst British Prime Minister for Ireland since Lloyd George himself. He's an absolute disgusting unionist of the worst type. And we know what's going to happen. He is going to be ruthless when it comes to Ireland. And the Irish are going to take up arms again. And you're going to have another round of... Uh, Irish nationalist patriotism, which we want to avoid if we can, but we won't be able to avoid it because he won't allow it. We're going to have, Starmer is going to, he's already doing it. He's already said he will not honour the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. Now, the Irish have fought uh, periodically at least three times in the last century and and in this century, and they will fight again if they have to. And th that man is uh, like the Tories even have more common sense when it comes to Ireland. Uh, like 
Sunak gave them the best deal they could get. The unionists were not. They got they could stay in the EU and they get the benefits of uh, being out of the EU at the same time. They didn't accept it, and they won't walk the good Friday. Could you please round up now? Please, can you wind down now? I have other people. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, William. Okay. Uh, thanks for bringing in Pam. I'm going to bring in Pamela Blakelock. Ian, would you like me to bring in a few people and then? Yeah, bring a few. Up? Yeah, I've got. Yeah. I'm Please. going to bring in Pamela now. Pamela Blakelock. Hi everyone. Hello, Paul. Um, yeah. So uh, it was really a continuation of what um, has been put forward. So I've been arguing in my CLP. Uh, that Labour has always been much more a bourgeois party than um, than supporting the workers. And what I, the evidence uh, I was given of the pro-imperialism um, was um, the the role in India, um, the, the fight against the Mau Mau, Ireland, of course, Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and now Israel, pro-Zionism. And I just wondered if, you know, it was worth going over some of the other appalling pro-imperialist um, and um, anti-colonial freedom struggles. I mean, I assume particularly in, in, in Africa, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe Zimbabwe and South Africa. Anyway, I, I think, you know, the whole history is of pro-imperialism and, and anti-colonial struggles. And I just wondered if you could go into a bit more detail thanks thanks very much pamela uh i've got conchita Hello, everybody um i'm feeling really bad because of what's happening on the news all this week really bad but anyway uh one connection is i would be interested to know about people like um, Moses Montefiore. Um, I have a sort of um, indirect connection in that I know that um, the um, portrait gallery in Trafalgar Square, the original idea of it being put together was through the amazing paintings that Moses Montefiore collected and he donated all his paintings when he died to the nation and um, that was the sort of impetus for uh, actually doing up what used to be a block of stables into eventually a portrait gallery and with a lot of the foundation of his paintings which before that had been housed in a sort of kind of house um, nearby. And uh, I, this is Lady Montefiore's cookbook. It was published in 1846. This is a photocopy of it, which I managed to get because the Montefiores had a weekend house in uh, Thanet and I went to boarding school there. Uh, and I always was fascinated uh, by the name because they were Sephardic Jews and that's my Spanish connection. And I only got hold of this book um, about four days ago and looking, and these were high society people to be invited to their dinners and to be invited to their home was a special occasion for guests and they were mu very much part of society but looking through these uh, cookery books is very traditional Jewish cooking and it is amazing from the recipes a lot of them I would be squirmish in um, that you have a family that really built up their wealth uh, in the UK before Zionism in a sense before Jewish Zionism they had a connection to Zionism but 
I would be very interested in knowing a history of Jewish people in London in particular, that uh, their society and their participation in um, East End society, the way they lived, the way the community uh, struggled together, and it was very much a very similar struggle to the um, Irish struggle in London. Um, because um, to me, from reading this book, it seems that the community was very poor. And yet something about them and their particular way of living in London created an amazing community before the Zionist ideas that we interpret now, that we know now, uh, came about. Um, and that's it. I cannot sort of, uh, it is a question in my head that might bring some answers that are far more reassuring about perhaps the involvement of Jewish people in the development of the politics in the Levant, for example. I don't know. Uh, today or this week, we're learning how many different interpretations we have of history and everything. Everybody has a different way of explaining it, of saying what's going on. So going back to the basic uh, neighbors in our own community in London and also I think in uh, there were also Jewish communities in the north of England but they were very much I think part of the working class and maybe those communities were separated parallel separations and we've lost a history of a sect of Jewish people we wouldn't know about this is just an intuition. So that's my question. Is it, if anybody knows about that, uh, is it worth studying in relation to Marx and Engels and socialism and the socialism that I've got an instinct that this community had in London? Um, right. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll come back and take a few of those, that's all right. I can't hear you, Carol. Just be mute. Would you like to come in now, Ian? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 more I know people. nothing about the Montefiore family, I have to say. Uh, Simon Seabag Montefiore is a dodgy historian, as far as I can see, but uh, just, <laughs> I know nothing about them. The Jewish history of London is, is fascinating. Uh, and if you, if you, if you walk through uh, East London, you will find vestiges of Huguenots, uh, the Jewish community. There were different... Um, migrations into the UK, uh, the Sephardic, all the Jews in Britain were murdered in 1290, murdered or, or forced to, to convert, um, and weren't allowed back until Cromwell. Um, and most of those that came back from the 1650s through to the 18th century were Sephardic. And representations of Jews, for example, in the right, in the art of uh, William Hogarth uh, doesn't tend to be very complimentary, but uh, this is obviously a fairly well um, established group. Prior to 1290, uh, they occupied a, a stratum within British society uh, and, and relatively high status. If you go to Lincoln, for example, just down the road from the cathedral is a place called the Jews House, and it's obviously a very nice place to have been. Uh, and before the massacre of 1290, Jewish population uh, were kind of co co partners alongside and came with the Norman invasion. Uh, anyway, the Sephardic uh, um, migration uh, up to about the 18th century. From the late 18th century, early 19th century, then most of the Jewish immigrants were Ashkenazi, and uh, from Central escaping the, the, the pogroms. And, and, yeah. and the point about them was that they were left wing. Very few of them had any interest whatsoever in Zionism, and Zionism had no purchase whatsoever in the, in the context of the Jewish community in Britain or elsewhere until after the Second World War. Um, Britain, uh, the, the Labour Party in office, 
uh, did nothing. Um, I think uh, Ramsay MacDonald uh, had some kind of hand in trying to uh, change the uh, 19, the, the appalling kind of 1922 Winston Churchill attitude towards Jewish migration to Palestine, because in the world, in the world of, uh, um, uh, what was his name, Sir Anthony Storrs, um, uh, to turn Palestine into a, a little loyal Jewish Ulster in a hostile sea of potential, uh, potentially hostile sea of Arabism. The aim was to create a, a settler state that would owe its allegiance to the British Empire. And uh, one can see this in the writings of Abraham Leon and, of course, Nathan Weinstock, uh, excellent book called Zionism, False Messiah. But look, 1948, Israel becomes a, a, an entity. Uh, and uh, throughout the period of uh, the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, um, there has been uh, effectively an affiliate of the Israeli Labour Party to the British Labour Party. It used to be called Poli Zion. Um, but and, and is now uh, it's changed its name, but it's still there. Uh, effectively, the representatives of the Israeli Labour Party is affiliated uh, to uh, the British Labour Party and has always exerted its influence. And Israel has always been a feature of uh, initially British foreign policy intervention in the Middle East, uh, whether it's been Tory or Labour. Uh, and uh, and but of course, um, after eighteen uh, after nineteen forty eight. Um, uh, the Labour government tried to restrict Jewish immigration into Palestine uh, and therefore uh, the Stern Gang um, and uh, various other uh, Zionist groups um, effectively fought the British state for independence for Israel uh, and, and including killing British person, service personnel and so on. Um, I don't want to create the impression that there were no decent socialists whatsoever within within the Labour Party. Uh, uh, the ILP for quite a long time acted as a kind of ginger group within uh, the Labour Party. George Orwell, for example, uh, who fought in the Spanish Civil War, um, uh, he, he fought alongside the PUM, uh, Partido Obrero Unificación Marxistas, because uh, they were affiliated to the independent Labour or the in in. The Independent Labour Party had uh, fraternal links with the Poom. Uh, and so uh, George Orwell, uh, if you read Homage to Catalonia, uh, he uh, turned up in Barcelona and joined the Poom militia rather than the International Brigade because he wasn't a member of the Communist Party. So you know, not everybody was in the Labour Party. It, it was completely dreadful. Um, but the, 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 the role of the Labour Party uh, in, in international affairs and British imperialism and involvement in the Middle East ha has been uh, almost universally despicable. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, I've got some more people that want to come in. I'm going to bring Steve Freeman in now. Well, there we go. I'm unmuted myself. Hi, Ian. Thank you for that. Um, uh, talk is get, getting me thinking about a few things. I'm, I'm going to take up that point where you talked about the English working class being backward. Oh, pl well, politically, I mean, I think backward politically is what it means, or conservative. And you, and then you spoke in that context of um, imperialism, quite well, rightly, of imperialism. Uh, but maybe that one day this uh, whole thing, there would be a great, I wouldn't use the term great leap forward, but uh, there would be a great leap forward. <laughs> the English working class would leap forward in a great way uh, and go from the back of the queue to the very front of the queue, you know, become the vanguard one day, who knows. But I, I, that's kind of, that's an interpretation of that quote that you that you gave us. And I'm, so I was just, so I wanted to trace through and I was thinking about the, that this imperialism, as you say, the symbol of imperialism very much was the monarchy, of course. From uh, And if you, if you go back to the 19th century, before the period you're talking about, the dominant politics in the English uh, working class was Republican. And, and you can see that strand in Chartism, right the way down, back to Tom Paine, right the way through to the 1870s, and the Land and Labour League, uh, which which had the paper Republic, which Marx was a member of the Land and Labour League, 
And then after in the 1870s, it declines. And that republicanism goes into the Democratic Federation. And then the Democratic Federation, it sort of slips out. When you get to the Social Democratic Federation, socialism has taken over. And that kind of Republican bit has kind of disappeared. So what you're really getting is you're getting loyalism as the predominant. If we were going to talk about the Labour Party, we could call it bourgeois, and everybody's discussing whether it's bourgeois workers or all those other things. But in terms of culture, it's a loyalist party. It's the loyalist Labour Party. Her Majesty's Labour Party, His Majesty's Labour Party, a party that's loyal to the Crown, because, of course, the Crown, we're not just talking about the King in that sense. King's merely the symbol of the state. And so you have that current. Now, trying to trace through loyalist Labour, you can see in, if you look at Clause 4, so-called radical, it's a loyalist clause because it doesn't have any republicanism in it whatsoever. It's going to nationalise everything full stop. And, and quite significantly, um, the, the, um, Beatrice and Sidney Webb wrote, you, you mentioned them later on in the 30s and how they turned over to Stalinism, but they wrote a, a, a pamphlet called A Socialist Commonwealth, which I thought was a very good idea. But when I read it, when I had a look at this book, they had a king in their socialist commonwealth because they couldn't conceive of ever having a country without a king, you know, because that's so deeply embedded in our culture. So, of course, we're going to have a socialist commonwealth. And obviously, we didn't need to mention it, but the, we can naturally assume it would have a king. And so, the, uh, but there is a Republican tradition also hidden away in there. You can find it a little bit in Keir Hardy and George Lansbury, but obviously the most important one that you mentioned was James Connolly who obviously therefore became the leader of the 1916 uprising and set up the Irish Socialist Republican Party. And the, the, we didn't, you didn't mention in there, but I mean, you could mention everything, but the Socialist Labour Party, which was like the British Socialist Party, they all came out of, I think, the... Um, um, they all came out, what was it? The S SDF. They all came out of the SDF, right? The BSP. And in 1903, when the Socialist Labour Party of Connolly was set up, they had in their, at their founding conference, they had a debate. What should we call the Socialist Labour Party? And the answer was the, the debate that they had was between whether we should call it the Socialist Labour Party or whether we should call it the Republican Socialist Party. Right. And of course, we know that the Socialist Labour Party won. And as you say, quite the reason it won, of course, because Connolly was in thrall more to Daniel de Leon and Daniel de Leon, the syndicalist from America, their party was called the Socialist Labour Party. So they decided they would follow the de Leonite and gave it that name. But the name Republican Socialist Party was in effect where Connolly went eventually. He became a Republican Socialist in Ireland. And he had, and he, he 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 led. He played a leading role with the Citizens Army in the 1916 uprising. So I think the Republican Socialist and Loyalist Labour are still two very important traditions hidden in hidden in all that. If you were doing a tree, you know, if you kind of did as a tree, really, but it's hidden in there. Is that, and, and that's where obviously I'm kind of interested in tracing that through uh, right the way down to today, of course. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, Ian, would you, would you would you like me to bring somebody else in? Yeah, yeah please. Uh, Paul, Paul's been waiting a long time. Uh, over to you, Paul. You're, you're mute, Paul. Paul, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ian, uh, for a very interesting and thoughtful contribution. Um, it was good to listen to you again. Um, I've got a question which is to do with the the left that emerged at the time. I think um, out of the split in the the I think the BSP. I think it was. I'm not sure of the actual detail, but I'm thinking of people like um, is it Sylvia Pankhurst or Emily Pankhurst and. Uh, thinking of Guy Aldred up in Scotland and uh, I'm also thinking of Lenin's critique of 
that position. I'm just wondering if you could say some more about that. That's my first question. The second question is um, about um, one of their uh, tactics, which was the known as the Sinn Féin tactic, which you're probably aware of, which is a kind of positive abstentionism that you would stand communists and socialists on a platform of exposing the undemocratic nature of parliament um, so they wouldn't take their seats but they would uh, attempt to propagandize for workers forms of democracy as opposed to bourgeois forms of democracy that's how i understand the position roughly i might have distorted it but yes thanks again for your your thoughts on um, the labor party and its origins i think um, the Labour, my understanding is even the ILP, which you mentioned quite favourably, was hostile to Marxism. It certainly was hostile to John McLean when he attempted, when he came back out of jail for his anti war activities and tried to um, get his job back in the Scottish Labour College as teaching Marxism. Uh, he was told he couldn't, he had to give up his Marxist. Um, education and refused to do that, which says a lot of what happened to him subsequently. Um, yeah, and also, um, I also liked your emphasis on um, the Webs and the Fabians. And um, uh, my understanding of the Webs is that they are they were positivists, and as following Auguste Comte rather than anything to do with Marx or Engels. And the idea that the, which is also in John Stuart Mill's thinking as a liberal, that you know that there are these class interests which are um, uh, lead to conflict between the the root capitalist class and the working class, uh, and the only ruling group that can see the general good and the common good for all of uh, the nation uh, is the um, intelligentsia. The scientists the artists and the intellectuals and that is that informs their um attachment to the to stalin soviet union they saw that as being a, a realization of a positivist utopia thank you very much paul um ian would you like me to bring in one other person yeah yeah sure yep i've got raymond to bring in uh thanks Joe. um Getting back to the early socialist movement in Britain and how they were uh, influenced by liberalism and how the new socialist movement morphed from liberalism to what we know today. But I think there was an even more fundamental ideological uh, input at play, and that was Christianity. With its messages of turn the other cheek, charity instead of solidarity. And I believe moving away from the use of violence when violence is required is a big weakness in revolutionary uh, the, the, the revolutionary tradition. And the other one that Ian talked about was the role of syndicalism. And Tom Mann was probably one of the most famous syndicalists in Britain at the turn of the century. But he actually moved and became a founder member of the Communist Party. He moved away from syndicalism Yet today we find that the union which he reorganised, uh, the uh, Amalgamated Engineering Union at the time, in 1923 became General Secretary, he reorganised it on the basis of democratic centralism. And it became one of the most revolutionary trade union organisations in Britain. I was a member at the time in the 60s and the 70s when it was spearheading the working class movement, uh, challenging anti-trade union legislation. And was a real challenge to existing society in Britain. Yet today we've moved backwards. We've got another leadership in that union now, Unite, which is out and out syndicalist. So, you know, really, I'm asking you to sort of elaborate and expand on the role of Christianity in hindering the development of a revolutionary transition in the British working class movement, and why on earth are we moving back to? the uh, influence of syndicalism when we thought we'd done away with it in the 60s and the 70s. Thank you very much, Raymond. Um, I think Victor has at last overcome his problems. 
So Victor has the last hand up. Shall, can I bring Victor in now? Ian, okay. I'm going to bring Victor in. Good evening, comrades. I'm sorry that I've been having such problems with my gremlins and viruses. I was almost on the point of deciding that I'll perhaps best not contribute. But I think there are some interesting points that I could illuminate. Not least of all is the habit of us referring to something called a Labour Party. Maybe there was a Labour Party when you all joined it, but it's not a Labour Party now. It's no more a Labour Party now than if I put a bottle of, up with urine and put it on a supermarket or an off-licence shelf, it would become a bottle of whiskey. It is now a Blairite Lino Party. Lino, Labour in name only. And I think we ought to be careful with our terminology because careless terminology could deceive voters. And I think we should be too honest and too decent to want to participate in helping the likes of charlatans like Stormtrooper to con and deceive voters. Now, the uh, topic that Tina raised as to whether uh, Stormtrooper is or isn't a nastier piece of work than Mr. Blair is an interesting one. I would say that at this stage in their political cycle, if you compare this stage in Stormtrooper's life with that of uh, Blair, Starmer is definitely the more obnoxious guy. Before he came to power, Blair could still pretend he was a mate of Arthur Scargill and somehow had vague socialist connections. At this stage, Stormtrooper has already knifed Corbyn in the back, and we know now that that was all an act and a scam, his socialism. So I would say that perhaps the Stop Starver campaign are right in what they say. However, let's look to the future. And I think the future is rather bleak now. A stormtrooper government looks almost inevitable. Big business is behind him. Mainstream media is behind him. The deep state is behind him. And that was more or less Boris Johnson's last words from the dispatch box as Prime Minister, though it didn't get reported in the Blairite Brainwashing Corporation. Now, when you joined the uh, Labour Party, as you used to be able to call it, I'm sure it was possible to genuinely believe that the Victor, Labour Party Victor, had something can you please be winding up now, Victor? Can you please yeah. be winding up now? of course, providing education, housing, etc. The current Blairite party is destroying cheap housing, privatising the health service, has nothing to offer the working class, and is therefore relying on wealthy people for its support. And the majority of people who are working class who will eventually realise this and therefore, we're going to face a dire choice as to whether Starmer decides to go for an authoritarian leadership state or whether he continues to risk democracy. The danger being that with Starmer having successfully discredited the left, a democracy will rear to the right like it has done in Europe. There's some thoughts for you to consider. Sorry to have kept you so busy. Bye. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Victor. Uh, I didn't see any actual questions for Ian there, but thank you very much. Uh, thank you all, comrades, all. all. Um, if, if, there's a few things. Um, indeed, uh, well, it's interesting to, to mention Lenin. Um, and it's interesting to mention Lenin in the context of the British Labour Party. We've already mentioned the, the idea that Lenin's argument was in uh, left-wing communism and infantile disorder uh, that communists should effectively support the Labour Party. And in a sense, that has been used as the justification for decades 
of um, Marxist entryism into the Labour Party of one sort or another. We can debate till the cows come home whether that has been fruitful um, or whether uh, Marxists entering the Labour Party rather than organising as Marxists has simply helped to keep the stinking corpse of social democracy above ground a bit longer than uh, was absolutely necessary. Um, it, when in, in Lenin's left-wing communism and infantile disorder, the people he attacks are Willie Gallagher in Scotland. Uh, he attacks um, Sylvia Pankhurst uh, then in East London. Uh, as, uh, uh, so you have um, Sylvia Pankhurst later went on to form a, a, a separate communist party, a, 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 a um, I forget what it was called. Revolutionary Workers' Party or something, um, and uh, took a kind of uh, abstentionist position with regard to working not only with the Labour Party, uh, but with um, uh, even with the Communist Party of Great Britain, because she rejected Lenin's perspective. Now, what I've tried to argue throughout is that all the parties of um, the Second International uh, effectively if you want to put it this way, betray the working class. Uh, all the parties of the Second International, uh, one can name, uh, give honourable mentions to people who didn't support, for example, participation in, in World War II, but they all did. And the, I, I would argue that that has to be explained. And it, it's not enough just to simply talk about the betrayal of leadership. Uh, just in the same way, I don't think it's enough to talk about Starmer as being you know, a bit like Blair, and therefore he's going to be dreadful. We know he's going to be dreadful. We know he is a, absolutely committed to the, the same trajectory that the Labour Party has been on through its entire history, is to make Britain uh, and the world a safe place for capitalists to make profits in. Uh, and, and if that means um, killing millions uh, to, to make sure uh, that uppity foreigners don't want their own countries back, uh, then that's exactly what he'll do. Um, now, uh, coming back to, to Lenin and his support for the uh, the idea that the Communist Party should should give a kind of conditional support to uh, the Labour Party. The question is, did Lenin really understand just how bourgeois the parties of the Second International were? Um, over the years, uh, I've been very familiar with the idea that the reason why we've never had socialism, the reason why we've not had a, a, a proper Marxist party in a sense, is because of uh, Stalinism on the one hand and social democracy on the other. And I think that's a perfectly fair and reasonable point. So Stalinism and social democracy have been an impediment to the development of a world-class consciousness. Um, however, uh, imperialism predates that and the awfulness of the Second International predates Stalinism. Um, and of course, social democracy itself uh, in the form taken by, for example, Clause 4 of the Labour Party's constitution, uh, was in fact in itself partly a response to Stalinism, uh, a, a, a way of, of, of directing the energy of the working class into electoral politics rather than revolutionary politics. At the same time, Stalinist parties, uh, often taking money directly, from the Soviet Union, uh, intervened wherever and whenever possible to sabotage workers' movements. In the end, all the the main official communist parties became agents of agents of the uh, uh, foreign policy of the Soviet Union. Um, coming back to the question of Christian socialism, um, I don't know enough really to say why that would have been an impediment. My own feeling is that of itself, um, it, it wasn't. So Tom Mann, for example, was a committed Christian. He was an Anglican, and yet one of the finest trade unionists going. Um, there were other committed Christians who were very left-wing as well. Certainly Marx, uh, Karl Marx, never had any kind of problem with the idea of people having a religious, uh, a religious faith. Um, his own perspective as, on it, as you know, was rather that it was the heart of a heartless world, the sigh of the oppressed creature and still saw it as, in a sense, the basis of a protest. Um, but I, I don't really know enough to say, and I, I can't think of reasons 
I mean, it's certainly the case, I think, that uh, when, when people have said that the, the Labour Party owed more to um, Methodism than Marxism, uh, they, they have a point in the sense that there was a, a, a moral opposition to the, the worst aspects of capitalism. And from that point of view, that is a an understandable kind of justification for uh, a, 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 a reformist perspective. And of course, the interesting thing came about after the Versailles Treaty, which was John Maynard Keynes. John Maynard Keynes, rather than Marx, provided a economic uh, theoretical basis for uh, an interventionist perspective for states, state so-called socialism. Well, not socialism, but it, but a kind of state intervention, uh, state social democracy, if you like, um, and uh, uh, Keynes effectively provided an economic uh, justification in the way that bourgeois sociology provides an ideological justification. And Paul, you're right. You know, uh, Beatrice Webb was a sociologist, um, and and, and, a, and a, a, a thoroughgoing Comtean at that. You know, a thoroughgoing positivist at that. I think we should never forget that as communists, we have always been in the vanguard of, of, of people demanding reforms in no small part because we're on the side of the working class. And I, for example, particularly given my daughter's got cystic fibrosis, would defend with my dying breath the, the, the right to, to free medicine. But let's do it in the context of what a socialist society would be like. It wouldn't be just the, simply the nationalizing the hospitals and, and organizing in such a way that it effectively simply provides a guaranteed market for capitalist pharmaceutical industries. Uh, it would be one in which health would become um, a, a, a top priority for all and free social care. I can predict exactly what's gonna happen uh, with the next Labour government uh, with regard to health and social care. Um, Doctors will still continue to be badly paid. Why? Because that will mean they will leave the NHS and the the, the path to the full privatization of healthcare will take the, the will follow the model of dentistry. Uh, try getting an NHS dentist now. Uh, it's not worth their while uh, to work in the NHS. And it will, the same will go for medicine. Um, you know, try getting social care for an elderly relative with Alzheimer's disease it'll cost you the house uh, if not more besides um, and we're going to see this continued movement and from that point of view I'm not pessimistic ironically um, I'm more optimistic because what, what we don't have anymore is the Stalinism and social democracy which we had to fight all, all along the numbers of people who have been genuine Marxists over the last 70 years has been very few uh, we can't in include the Communist Party of Britain, for example, which is just effectively the kind of uh, it sets itself up as the, the of the conscience of a of a of a th of a thoroughly corrupt trade union leadership, um, and trade unions which have become little more than specialist adjuncts of hu human resources departments. Um, so we're in favour of reforms, but reforms that are part of a trajectory towards the, the radical reconstitution of society at large. Uh, and if we take, for example, the Middle East, instead of the support for Zionist in, Zionist agents of imperialism in the Middle East, uh, we would be in favour of a, a, a socialist federation of the Middle East, uh, where all working people uh, would, 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 would have an equal standing. Um, so I'm not pessimistic. Have I missed anything out? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, oh, John McLean, briefly. Uh, uh, yes, uh, honorary uh, consul uh, of the Soviet Union. Yeah, ironically, didn't join the Communist Party of Great Britain and retained a kind of Scottish socialist perspective. Uh, one has to salute the uh, courage of the man and his uh, persistence in providing a Marxist education, come what may. Uh, but we shouldn't um, deify them either. Uh, and just the same way with James Connolly, enormous respect to a man of great courage and determination uh, and the, the, the best of his generation, which is why it was a bloody damn shame he threw in his lot with nationalists and paid the ultimate price for it. 
but we'll look at him a bit more when we look at syndicalism. Thank you, comrades. I've enjoyed all the contributions from the floor, uh, and I hope I haven't bored you too much. Thank you. Good night. Not at all, Ian. Absolutely fascinating. And great questions and great answers to them. Thank you so much, Ian, for presenting tonight and leading the discussion. And um, we just wish everyone a very, a very good rest of your evening. Goodbye. <laughs>